we'll continue. What was the title again? Reprogramming your heart for kingdom breakthroughs. Mm. How many of you are here on Sunday? How many of you were blessed on Sunday? How many of you have started reprogramming? How many of you know it costs money to reprogram? What does it cost? Money. It costs time as well to reprogram. Is that not true? Say amen. I said my heart bleeds when I see needs go unmet. This was what I started with on Sunday. Many suffer from all kinds of things, from rejection, and it affects the quality of their relationships. Many have needs and they, that they think they need a deliverance from some strong demonic powers. And it may be true, many need money, love, and relationships, and etc. I see fears, insecurity plaguing the human race. And I ask myself, is there a solution? And I answered the, the question myself, and I said, Jesus is the answer. Can I hear an amen? amen? I said, Jesus is the answer, but we have responsibilities. And God has plans. And I also attacked the fact that some people say, don't raise people's hopes too high, lest they get disappointed. And I said, I will raise their hopes. Say amen. amen. I want to be a, 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 a dealer in hope. <laughs> I will raise their hopes. What if their hopes get dashed and they don't get fulfilled? Then it will be a learning experience for them how to make their hopes come to pass. Say amen. amen. The title is Reprogramming Your Heart for Kingdom Breakthroughs. And I started by saying that there is a programming that is going on already. How many of you remember that? Yeah. I said there are three things that they used to program people psychologically. Observation. Can anybody remind me? Imitation, imitation and repetition. repetition. Observation, imitation, and repetition and it is known psychologically that when you are relaxing it's the best time for your mind to pick things so a lot of the tv and whatever we all sit beside they're already programming our minds what you observe all the time what you keep observing what you repeat your mind is being programmed whether you know it or not your mind is being programmed and unfortunately that programming is not coming from heaven it's coming from hell and i said that we were born when God created man, man was not created to be dominated by his environment. Man was created to dominate his environment. I said, but when man fell, his environment began to dominate him. In other words, man had internal control, but when man fell, man submitted to external control. You must understand that because God designed your spirit to regulate your soul and your soul to regulate your body. But when the fall happened, your body begins to regulate your soul. And that's why I said that when you ask somebody, for instance, how has the day been? He says, the weather is terrible. What has the weather got to do with your day? Absolutely nothing. But for the programming you have exposed your mind to, the weather begins to be a factor. So I asked the question, I'm asking it again. Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? A thermometer lies there and regulates and no, just records what goes on. Is that not true? A thermostat. If there's a thermostat in a system, it makes sure that everything is regulated by the set temperature in that thermostat. And I'm saying to you that you must be a thermostat, not a thermometer. So the first point we raised was attitude. And I went to town on the word attitude. <laughs> Because attitude is a major, major subject in many of the development, personal development story, uh, books around. And I took some reading from John Maxwell. I said that our attitude must be that of a winner. I play until I win. Say amen. We must have a, what is the thing that informs your attitude? Your thoughts and your feelings. They inform your attitude. So if you don't know how to regulate your thoughts and your feelings, your attitude will be something else. And life is such that you see what you expect to see. You see what you're looking for. Whatever you expect is what you will get. So Satan knows how to program. You see, this is what I believe Satan has done. He understood what God designed us to function like. He simply changed the software in the hardware. That's all. 
The software of sin came in when man fell, and the hardware just began to play back whatever the software had conditioned it to do. What do I mean by that? Everything good that God has created, he uses it to pervert God's purposes. Think about it. God created man with an imagination that has the ability to create whatever a man can imagine. Satan fills that imagination with negative stuff and man has now begun to create new ways of committing sin. True or false? So everything good that Satan has, God has ordained, Satan has brought his own software into it. Through sin, Satan has been permitted to bring, so he's perverting the use of everything God ordained. So that's why it's an evil environment. You cannot afford to live your life normally. Is somebody hearing me here? So your attitude must be that of I'm a winner, not a loser. That commitment will inform a willingness to change, to grow, to improve. And I said when Paul says things like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that speaks of his attitude as well. When Paul says that I, I, I have learned to abase and to abound, amen, it speaks of his attitude. When Paul says, I forget the things that are behind me, I press on towards the mark of the high call of God in Christ, it speaks of what? His attitude. So we need to know how to change some things of our attitude. How many of you think you need an attitude reformation? Part of that attitude is I'll give my best, my all. I will learn my lessons. Say amen. How many of us think attitudes are necessary for us to change? Many of us need to change so many things in our attitude. I read from Charles Swindle's quotes. It says, as long as I live and all of that, he says, I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. So it's not what happens to you that is the issue. It's how you react to it. Just as our attitudes are extra pluses in life, they also make the difference in leadership. Leadership has less to do with position and all of that. It is on record that when the one who sack people... They look for the majority of the reasons why they sack people from any place of work is more attitude than competence. Yes. So what can we do to change our attitudes? I was told that Philo Psychology 101 taught that there was this farm man who thought the neighbor's son stole his uh, farm equipment. And so every time the neighbor's son appeared, he was looking at him with the eye of a thief until he found his farm equipment somewhere where it dropped. And he found out that it was his eyes and his feeling and his thought that made him have an attitude that that guy was a thief. The guy was not a thief. You know what that tells me? You see what you want to see. You can look for a thief somewhere and you have many confirmations. If you were the devil, wouldn't you let people see you as very strong so that you can confirm in their lives that you are very strong? <laughs> it's, let me read some things to you about attitude. It will help you. How do you change your attitude? you like to know how you change your attitude? Identify problem feelings. That's the earliest stage of awareness and easier to declare. You know, you need to examine yourself, take an inventory of your own internal state and know what attitudes you have. Identify problem behavior. Identify problem thinking. Then, develop a plan for right thinking. Say amen. This plan should include a written definition of desired right thinking, a way to measure progress, a daily measuring of progress, a person to whom you are accountable, a daily diet of self-help materials associating with right thinking people. So we've talked about that. So we've talked about, so you understand programming. Through observation, imitation, and repetition, you're being programmed. You understand habits. They're a product of your programming. How do you replace a habit? How do you get rid of a habit? By replacing it. Say amen. We have many habits that we're not even conscious of. How many of you know that? We have habits we're not even, we're not even aware that we have them. Until you begin to do a self-awareness, you will not even know how much of that you have. If we take an inventory of our lifestyle, we shall see habits we never settled to consciously develop. Our attitudes are formed from our thoughts, feelings, and expectations. Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? Is the weather a reason for your being? Why? Programming. You are designed to be internally regulated, not externally. The software is at work. I'm just reviewing what we've done. And we talked about developing this first point was developing a winning attitude. And the second point we talked about is know your tools. Say amen. What are the tools? Matthew 6, 
says that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, every other thing shall be what? Added. Amplified says with the way of God, God's ways of being right and doing things. So you need to know how God operates. How does God do things? People believe that God does miracles. Is that not true? But does he? The question is, does God do miracles? Well, when he told Moses to go and tell his people to go and deliver his people, it was when Moses asked the question, what if they don't believe? Before God did a miracle, he told him what to do about a miracle. In other words, his original plan was not miracle, it was his instruction. So how does God do miracles today? He does them in confirmation to his word. In other words, if there's no word, there might be no miracle. Is somebody hearing me? Jeremiah 1 12 says he watches over his word to do what? To perform it. Matthew, Mark 16 20 says he confirms his word with what? Signs following. So, how does God operate? By his word and by his spirit. So, let's go to our text scriptures again and then we we'll take off for today. Are you ready for today? Joshua 1 8. Let's go to Joshua 1 8 and look at the scriptures. I remember on Sunday I said if you have a bag of seeds and you don't plant your seed and you are believing God and you are wondering why God is allowing the harvest not to come, <laughs> you better plant the seed. Every of the points we've made, we're going to revisit them at different times, but let's just go on for today. Joshua 1.8 says, this book of the law shall not do what? Apart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way progr- prosperous and then you will have good success. So let's read that last bit again. For then God will make your way prosperous. Is that what he says? No. For then the devil will fight you as you want to succeed. Is that what he says? No. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have what? Good success. So if you look at the task before Joshua, it was such an enormous task. Joshua had seen a role model in the person of Moses. Moses had had all kinds of experiences of standing in the presence of God. His face was glowing with the glory of God. They've seen the Red Sea split open. They've seen all kinds of miracles. They've seen a great work that Moses had done. Now Moses had died, and Joshua was like quaking in his boots. He had served Moses, yes. He was called by God to take the people out of the, I mean, into the promised land. And God was now giving him the instruction as to what to do. If you analyze this instruction, you will realize God was telling him, let the control come from within, not from without. This book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mind, but say mouth. But you meditate in it, and I say thinking. And then you observe to do, ever say do. According to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. It's so important that we take responsibility for ourselves. It's on record today that every failure points at somebody else. Think about it. When somebody fails at something, you, you know what they say? It was somebody else that made it happen. I want to read something to you I saw somewhere. I hope I still have it here. It says, this man was in his 70s and he was still reading good stuff to, to affect his attitude. So his son said, Dad, are you still reading all that stuff? He looked at me in the eye and said, Son, I have to keep working on my thought life. I'm responsible for, to have a great attitude and to maintain it. My attitude does not run on automatic. Wow. That's a lesson for all of us. We choose what attitudes we have right now. And it's a continuing choice. I'm amazed at the large number of adults who fail to take responsibility for their attitudes. If they are grumpy, someone asks why, they will say, I got up on the wrong side of the bed. When failure begins to plague their lives, they will say, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. When life begins to flatten out and others in the family are still climbing, they will say, well, I was in the wrong birth order in my family. When their marriages fail, they believe they married the wrong person. When someone else gets promotion they wanted, it's because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Do you notice something? They are blaming everyone else for their problems. The greatest day in your life and mine is when we take total responsibility for our attitudes. 
that's the day we truly grow up. Thank you for your silence. That's the day we truly what? So when are you going to start growing up? Or you've already started? Amen? That's the day we're going to start growing up. Some say, oh, it was, ah, it's that. Oh, it's this. Oh, ah. You know, I'm good. Everybody, everything else is wrong around me. It's just not my fault. It's just, I'm just a victim of my circumstances. It wasn't my fault. No, no, you better wake up. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm sure you're not the one they're talking about today. (sighs) For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So let's look at all the scriptures we read about. Third John, let's take Psalm 1. Let's take Psalm 1 verses 1 to 4. See, when you take responsibility, you will learn lessons you never learned before. You discover more about yourself. You make the necessary adjustments about your life, and you will make your way prosperous. Say amen. The difference between what the personal development people talk about and what the Bible says is that the Bible not only addresses your mind, it addresses your spirit. You see, the word of God is food for your spirit. So if you take it from the word, you feed your inner man to have strength, then you retrain your mind to think right. Remember, you have already been programmed to think wrong, no matter who you are. Hello? Hello? You know, a lot of people don't believe that. That's why we just keep doing what we're doing after we got saved. That's the truth. We believe that we're fine. Good or bad. True or false. Talk to me. We believe we're fine. So we just got saved and added religion to our relationship with God. So whenever God's word comes, we just interpret it in the light of the software in our minds. We never know that the software itself needs changing. So when the problems of our wrong software show up, guess who we blame? God. Why did God allow that happen to me? That's why we're sharing this kind of message. Say amen. Programs are, people have been programmed. God created man not to be regulated from without. How many of you think today that there is a greater propensity of sin going on in the world today? Is it true? Do you know that creativity has entered sinfulness now? Human beings are now creatively sinning. Why? Because God's creative potential in them is being used to manufacture more sin. And the church is doing nothing about it. Just say, well, you know, we're all human. We all sin. No, there's a program that is producing that. God, give us understanding. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Some people walk in the counsel of the ungodly and they don't see anything wrong with that. The word ungodly means wicked. By the way, a wicked person in the eyes of God is somebody who doesn't believe the Bible. Doesn't mean somebody who killed somebody, just does not, had no regard for God. You're wicked. Nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates what? Day and night. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall what? Prosper. The ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff the which wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment or sinners in congregation of righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous where the way of the ungodly shall perish. What is the secret of this tree that is planted by the rivers of water? Shall I tell you? When there is drought in every other place, that tree takes its root deep into the river bed and draws its own nutrition when there is drought around. That's what happens to the man who meditates in the word day and night. Say amen. The psalmist was saying he will be like that. Let's look at 3 John 2. 3 John 2. If you found it, let's read it together. 3 John 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be what? In health. Just as your soul prospers. Verse 3 says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you as you walk in the truth. I want you to take note of that. There's something about truth being in you as you walk in the truth. What is truth? Jesus said in John 17, he says, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. So it says, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth. That means truth can be in you only to the proportion that you walk in it. And if you do walk in the truth, the truth will be in you. Say amen. So the goal of all that we're saying so far 
is that there is an inner working, a, a software, a conditioning, a programming that has been put in us, either by our nature, nurture, environment, whatever. It has been programmed into us. And let me tell you this, the programming continues. Today when you look at the news and the radio or the TV, you know what they're telling you? They tell you who to vote for. Is that not true? They tell you what's going wrong in the world. Amen? They tell you what to buy. You know what they've done? They've even defined who a beautiful person is. So you and I are now living to maintain the kind of picture they paint for us that defines beauty. That's how subtle it is. I'm not looking too pretty. Who told you that? Should I tell you what the Bible calls beautiful? <laughs> Worship God in the beauty of his holiness. Holiness is beautiful. Does that throw your own software into confusion? Exactly. That's the point we're making. So these things are very subtle. So, you know, the young ones say, I don't listen to the lyrics, I just enjoy the beat. That's all you need for the thing to sink. That's all you need. Just listen. When you are relaxing, just... Dun, 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 dun. Whatever he's saying, you don't want to listen. But that's all you need. You don't want to listen is all you need. Your mind cannot tell whether it's an act, it is a show, or it is for real. Anything that your system is exposed to, it registers it. Are you ready for today? All right. So we've said a few of those things. Now, when things go consistently bad... You may need deliverance. Now, that's point number three. Say amen. <laughs> you may need what? And I know some people believe that deliverance is the only solution to their problem. And I agree with you. But it's only how you go about it that's the problem. Hello, somebody. And I said to us in, from John chapter 8, let's turn to John chapter 8 and verse 32. I said, there are two things to this deliverance that you need. You have a truth encounter and a power encounter. Say amen. And a truth encounter is a different ballgame from a power encounter. John chapter 8. I know many ministries have been majored on deliverance and they go on and on about one altar after the altar, one this and all kinds of stuff. I'll tell you what, God help all of us. Say amen. John 8.32 Verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in me, in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? They didn't say set you free. Make you free. Thank you. That's the difference between being made free and being set free. And we're going to discuss that today as part of our message today. What's the difference between being made free? That means the software in you changes. You are made free. You have been, something has replaced what was there before. You are made free. And that takes time. That takes process. That doesn't happen immediately. But being set free, John um, Romans 8 says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has done what? Set me free from the law of sin and death. I'll tell you what I found out from the teachings of Jesus. One time his disciples could not cast out a particular demon and he came and cast out that demon. And the disciples said, Master, how could we not do that? He said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. That tells me straight away that there's some setting free that will demand fasting. Is somebody hearing me here? But the making free will demand the word. If you want to really work in freedom and reprogram, there will be periods of your life where you go on a fast for the sake of being free from certain things. Because you want to be free. But what is the key to this freedom? The first word is consecration. Say amen. It's not just going on a hunger strike. It's consecration. You make up your mind to be separated from the world and the systems of the world and the sinfulness around you. Listen, guys, if you're a guy and you walk around with lust around you, one of the ways to be free from lust is to go on a three-day fast, meditating in the Word and praying to break the back of that spirit. Is somebody hearing me here? 
I don't care what the problem is. Jesus gave us the clue. He says, this kind goeth not out, <laughs> but by prayer and fast. That means there's some kind that will not go away just because you say Jesus is Lord of my life. You know that there is a bondage here, and you know you need to be free from it. You declare a fast. You go on a fast. Say amen. And you take on the word of God and say, I'm breaking the back of this thing. You're not going to hold me down. Say amen. I tell you what, when we begin to do that, then as you go on that fast, the same secret. The, the, the thing about the fast is this. Let, let me just help you understand it properly. Jesus was talking about three things in the book of Matthew. If I, let's go to Matthew chapter 6. That would be a, a good place to, to, to dwell on. Um, I think it's Matthew 17. Anyway, let's just take Matthew 6 and start there. Are you getting anything out of this? Okay, so let's... Let's take our time now. Is that good? We need to be free, don't we? How many of you think that program is just going to go just because you heard a sermon? <laughs> Are you kidding? Are you kidding? The program is going to confirm that you have not heard anything at all by confirming what you just thought you should be thinking about. Am I talking here? If God's going to, why did God tell Joshua, meditate there in their night that I may observe? So that Joshua would be controlled from within, not from without. And I checked Joshua's life. You know what I like doing? I checked the life of that person till the end. Just like I did a check on Peter's life some time ago, till the end. You know what I found out at the end of Joshua? I said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That means that guy's mind has been so changed that in spite of the defeats, in spite of the challenges, in spite of everything, he came at the end of his life and said, guys, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I checked the guy's life. He didn't just receive that instruction and made religion out of it. He walked in that instruction all his life to the point where he said, guys, we have lived before you right, but let me inform you, if God is God, serve him, but just for me and my house. In other words, if all of you are not going to serve God, I'm going to serve him. Now that is internal regulation. Am I making sense to somebody? Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, and let's look at what Jesus was teaching about in Matthew chapter 6. Remember, we're looking at what to do when you need deliverance. And this is a very good picture because in Matthew 6, Jesus hits three things on the nail, on, to nail it. Number one, he looks at your motive. He said, take heed that you do not your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. So he talks about, ever say given. given. Talk, say loud, given. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as a hypocrite, da, 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 da. Then in verse 5, it says, and when you pray. Everybody say, when you pray. Did you notice it didn't say, if you pray. It says, when you pray. Now, when I look at something, when he said in the other place, he says, this can go not out, but by prayer and fasting. He combined two things together to ensure that you walk in victory. Am I talking here? That means that if there's any bondage in your life, you don't need to stay in bondage. Say loud, amen. You need consecration, prayer, and fasting, and that bondage has to go. It has no choice. Say amen. Why? We're going to get into it in the next point, because this is still, if you need deliverance. Look at Matthew 6. It talks about giving, praying, and fasting. Verse 16 says, moreover, when you fast. Did you notice that again? It didn't say if you fast. So I want you to catch something there. Jesus made sure that in his teachings, he makes sure that those three things are done. Everybody say giving, praying, and fasting. Now, it's in the light of those three things you can now understand when he says, verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust dust uh, destroying where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light in you is, in, is, in, is darkness, how great is that darkness? What does this mean? It says the light of the body is the eye. <laughs> There's a Hebrew thing about this. But what it means is simply this. If my intention is evil, if my motivation is evil, if what I want to do is not seeking to please God, then the light in me will be dark. 
Remember on Sunday I said something. I said, if your attitude towards the word of God is such that you have a defense against everything the word says you should do, then the word will not open up to you. Now that's the same thing he's talking about here. If you read the Bible, it says forgive. You say, but God, you don't know what they did to me. If you read the Bible, it says deny yourself. You say, but God, you know it's difficult for me to do it. If you read the Bible, it says say no to sin. You say, but God, you are given a reason. There's a rebellion. Your eye is evil and the light in you will be dark. That's what this is talking about. If my motivation for what I'm doing is darkness, money, selfish, and everything carnal, my light will be dark. And many people, the light in them has become dark. Is somebody hearing me here? The lamp of the eye is the, of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of dark. That's why some people, no matter what you preach to them, it doesn't make any difference. Why? They have an evil eye. Their intention is evil. So you need to make some mega adjustments if you want this thing that I'm talking about to work for you. Is somebody hearing me here? And the person who has an evil intention has a justification for that intention. Is that not true? From the experience I've had, where I came from, the church I came from, I'm going to be careful about everybody. Evil eye. That's why... I learned this from John Maxwell. It says, they say experience is the best teacher. It says, no. Analyzed experience is the best teacher. You know the downside of that? When you analyze your experience and you run to the wrong conclusion, it's the worst teacher. That's why your eye is evil. I will not, somebody is jilted by a, a guy. I will never let any man jilt me again. Evil eye. No, settle down and learn the lesson that you should learn in that relationship. Then become better, not bitter. That experience has taught you something. But you see, if you don't analyze it, if you just react in the flesh, react in the feeling, I've, I've been hurt, I hate this, I don't do this. I don't, you are just immature, you are staying immature, and immature things will keep happening to you. Sit down, analyze that experience, become better. That's why I said the first thing is your attitude. You are a winner, not a loser. So no matter what you have gone through in life, make up your mind, it's going to be a stepping stone to greater heights. If you don't make up your mind, it will be a stumbling stone for the next thing in your life. You are a winner. It's an attitude. I don't care what the past is. I'm going to use it as a stepping stone to a greater height. In other words, I won't let my past dictate my future. Because of the power of choice. Is somebody hearing me here? So, you need to understand. If your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. That's why he went on saying, no one can serve two masters. For either you hate the one and love the other, else be loyal to the one and despise you. You cannot serve God and mammon. In other words, if your motive is selfish, you cannot truly be serving God. Do we all need motive checks? You better believe we do regularly. Motives are not things you settle once and for all. You keep them at, you know, everybody should have what I call spiritual inventories. Maybe every six months or every three months, depending on how active you are spiritually. Because motives can come creep on you anytime, and before you know what's happening, your motive is wrong. How will God let you see? Your crisis will reveal them. Say amen. And therefore, it goes on, verse 25. Therefore I said to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds. That's why I said on Sunday, I said, you say there's recession. I said, say that to the birds. Tell the birds there's recession. They say, eh, I didn't notice. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? You know what he's saying? All your human carrying of cares and worrying can change any circumstance. It's time to trust in the Lord. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider lilies of the field, how they grow, and then they're stolen or spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory. Is he saying you should not be concerned about what clothes you're going to wear as in nice looking clothes? No. He's saying don't make it a point of anxiety. Don't make it a point of anxiety. Don't make it something that will keep you awake all through the night. Why? It gives you the secret. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and every other thing will be what? 
added, that immediately defines success in another way. That success is not about going after things. Success is about going after God and his kingdom and things get added. So what is success? Becoming that person that things are added to. Let me give you one secret. Whatever you pursue after will elude you if it's in the natural. But when you pursue after God, he'll be found. Those who are running after money never have enough of it. Have you noticed? Because the more they have, the more they want. The flesh never says it's enough. Check out anybody who gives into the flesh. There's no end to it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. What are you going to find out in the kingdom of God? His ways of doing things. And that one of his ways is so in seed so in principle. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall never cease. Genesis 8.22. Say amen. So, when you're going to need deliverance, you need consecration. And then you need prayer and fasting. And then you will have had the setting free. Everybody says setting free. Now, to make free, you now go through in the word. Truth demands process. By internalizing truth, you set the process into motion. Truth can adjust you, give you a new perspective, replace error and falsehood in your heart and soul. Truth needs time. Pay attention to it. John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will or what you desire, and it shall be done unto you. In other words, the word in you guarantees prayer power. Am I making sense? You see, we said consecration, that means it's separating from. You don't just say, I'm going to run a fast. No. If you know the things that enable you or encourage you to go after things that are wrong, cut them out of your life administratively, do something about them, then go on a fast to break the back of that thing in your own soul. Can I hear an amen? amen. Then when you consecrate and go on a prayer and a fasting, then you, in that period you can also fellowship with the word of God. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. Remember what we read in 3 John 2. It says, I was glad when they said you are walking in the truth as the truth is in you. In other words, there is a truth that can be in you. You will walk in it and when you pray based on that truth, you get prayer power. Is somebody hearing me here? It's not just automatic. People carry the bag of seeds and say, I wonder why God is not allowing the seed to grow. Plant it. Plant it. You are not planting no seed. You are not getting no harvest. Have you noticed that all our prayer requests are, we want a harvest? Talk to me. Anything you want in life is a harvest. When I found that out, I began to get busy planting the seed. I want a happy home. Everybody say harvest. I want finances. Everybody say harvest. Now what is the seed? The word of God is the seed. Give me a poor man, has nothing to his name, but is hungry for God. Give us five years. That guy's life will be turned around and he will have stuff, money, and things to give away to other people. You know why I know that? For him to remain like that, the word of God will first come into him and change his identity. The word of God will enter his soul and give him a sense of belonging to God Almighty. The word of God will give him a sense of authority. And the word of God will enhance his potential. Before long, that person is productive and he's earning a good living. And if you're not careful, he will employ you. <laughs> Why? That's what the word can do. I'm giving you that example so you know just when we say the seed is the word. I'm not just talking about, you know, just reading a couple of scriptures and do nothing and say, I've planted the seed, I've planted the seed, now what next? No, do what the word says. Do what the word says. You've planted the seed. You know, I told, I told somebody, I said, your problem has gone on for so long because you've not found the real solution to it. Don't get me wrong, what we're sharing here does not mean you won't have problems. It simply means you know how to solve them. Welcome to the club of having problems. Life is full of them. It simply means you know how to solve them. Now, the seed is the word. Ever said the seed is the word? That's what Jesus said in the parable of the sower. He says there are some hearts. There are wayside hearts. There are roadside hearts. There are thorny hearts. There are, there are, there are whatever. What are, what are they? Roads? They are four. Remind me. Roadside, stony, thorny, and good. 
Even the good ones is 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100. So there's production, there's progressive reproduction. Say right. But the point I'm making is this if Jesus were to come and solve your problem, do you know the first thing he wants to do with your problem? To plant the seed. Say amen. The Bible says the sower soweth the word. Why did he sow the word? Because he needs a harvest. So what seed are you sowing? I'm just praying that God will give me a job. What seed are you planting? I'm just praying that God will. What, what? I'm just praying. No, 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 you don't understand. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and you discover how he operates. Say amen. How does he operate? Plant the seed. Where? In your heart. Amen, somebody. In your what? Heart. When you plant the seed, then you have something to go on with. Say amen. Number three. This is point number four now. Practices that would help. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Hallelujah. Are you ready to hear this one? Develop a word orientation of study, meditation, and confession. I want to break that down. Because we've said it so many times. We've told people to confess the word. Shall I tell you what meditation does? It enriches your imagination with realities from the Bible. Shall I say that one more time? How many of you have meditated so much in the Word that you can literally see Jesus healing the sick? Literally in your head. You see, God gave us an imagination that the enemy has played so much on. And people have kept, religion has kept that part of our lives from being affected by the faith that we have in God. And we wonder why negative things still happen. Shall I tell you? In the book of Genesis, when the people began to build a tower, the Bible says God said, nothing shall be able to stop them from doing what they have imagined to do. So God recognizes the power of imagination. If you want to know what Satan does, the moment you have a quarrel with your husband or wife, he imagines that you can have a divorce. You carry the imagination in your divorce and you act otherwise. You are being stupid. That imagination will create in your life what you have accepted. Is somebody who listened to me? How many of you understand imagination? <laughs> you meditate in the word to build a different picture in your mind. That is where the problem is. People here meditate. They think it's just a religious activity. Whether you do it or not, you're already meditating in something. That's the truth. Everybody's meditating in something. I know what we all meditate upon. Survival. If I lose this job, I'll make it. You meditate on the lowest things. Why? That's how you were trained. That's how you were programmed. Why don't you meditate on the highest things? Why do you think the Bible says every time in all the scriptures we've read, Joshua 1, 8, Psalm 1, meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do. That means that there is a scene that is not obvious until you begin to think through and paint the picture in your mind. Then you see something you never saw before. Why do you think it's that hard for people? Many people are lazy. They want somebody else to do it for them. I, 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 I don't see it. Then why would you see it? You're not pressing into it, are you? You know what I found out? The Bible says, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. It's called aggression. It's not, this is not for Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Jesus lost me, this I know. Tell, tell that to the kids. Are you listening to me somewhere? You know, I know nothing happens to me, but God just loves me. Slap, slap. Satan wants to mess your life up to the best of his ability. And he will stop at nothing to do it. If you don't know how to square up, let your jawbone square up and say, you know what, Satan? You and I are in this. I want to battle this thing till the end and I will win. Now, when you get to that point of seriousness, you get on the aggression, the Bible says. Since the day of John the Baptist, the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. It's good that it's a Wednesday service so nobody gets scared away. 
the violent take it by force. You're not going to tolerate the devil no more. You're not going to say, I don't know, why God is allowing this to happen to me. What does the Bible say? Anything that book says, I'm going to submit myself to that authority. And you, I double dog dare you, Satan, stand on my path. You know what they call backsliding now? Some demons will have to backslide. And say, nah, this is not the language that we programmed him to be saying. We programmed him for CCCC language. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells. And it's true, he loves you. Don't get me wrong. But you're not dealing with his loving you now. You're dealing with you making up your mind that the God of this world is not going to mess your future. So you need to develop that word orientation of study, meditation, and confession. Number two, you need to stay hungry for God. Hallelujah. <laughs> you need to do what? Stay hungry. And that's, that's where I got the scripture. Uh, since the day of John the Baptist, kingdom suffers violence, violence take it by force. I mean, I'm not sure John the Baptist was such a quiet guy. Hello. Such a nice guy. Do you think he was? No. So since the day of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it. Are you ready to take the, the kingdom? Are you ready to take the kingdom by force? Now, let me say the other practices that will help you. A word orientation of study, meditation, and confession. Stay hungry. Develop a prayer life. Interceding for others. Develop a prayer life of intercession. Just spend time knowing that on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, you want to spend quality time interceding for others. There's some practices. You know what I found out in life? If you're going to mature, it's going to boil down to one word, habit. If you're going to succeed, it's going to boil down to one word, habits. If you're going to be a failure, it's going to boil down to one word, habits. Whether you're looking at it from the career point of view, from a spiritual point of view, from a social point of view, from a relational point of view, it's the habits you cultivate that will determine what your future will look like. You know, people say things like, you know, God has a good future for me and he will work things out in his own time. Hello? So true. Sometimes he will work it out after you are dead. He will work it out. In his own time. No, he's eternal. He doesn't have time. So if you die, then he will still be working it out. I, sh I can assure you. But if you want it to work out in your own time, you cultivate the right habit. <laughs> oh, God will work it out. Didn't he get them into the promised land? He did. But is it the same guys who left Egypt and entered the promised land? No. So they died in the wilderness. He will work out his plans. That I can assure you. But whether you will be a part of it is another matter. So don't let anybody deceive you. He will work it out in his own time. Hallelujah. He will. I can guarantee he will work out his plans. But whether you will be part of it is what choices you make. Is somebody hearing me here? Look, develop a prayer life interceding for others. Develop a regular fellowship with other believers. The Bible says we should not forsake the assembling together. Amen? And then develop soul winning as a practice. You see, some of these habits are not very palatable. Some of these habits, your flesh will ladder, sleep, and relax, or do any other thing but do them. But let me tell you this. If you're going to build strength in any area of your life, it boils down to one word. Everybody say it again. Habit. You know the story of a man who was riding a horse wildly, and he was going, and he said, stop, stop, where are you going? He said, I don't know where I'm going. Ask my horse. You know what that horse is? Your habit. Your habit is taking you to the future. That's the truth. Your habit is taking you to your future. You have a lazy habit? I can tell you what your future looks like. Lazy. But a lot of people dream of big things that God will do in their lives. Ah, well, I'm full of such dreams. I'm still dreaming. Amen. Somebody says, well, you know, don't raise your hopes too high. Sorry, it's too late. I've raised mine. And anybody who comes around me, I'll raise theirs. Not in a stupid way. 
But raise your hopes high. Pin the imagination of your heart with the things of God. The Bible says it's able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all you can ask, think, or imagine. So I'd rather him do something beyond what I can imagine than go to the lowest and be thinking just megaly, you know. No, I want him to do something beyond what I can imagine. So I stretch my imagination and then let him do beyond that. So when he does, I say, oh, you are too much, oh Lord. That's what makes life adventurous and a dramatic one for me. Amen. Well, some people, they're only so low, you know, don't raise your hopes too high. Don't raise it too high. Don't raise it too high. Sorry, I want to raise mine very high. High enough for God to do something about it. Well, God help you. What else do you need to do? Stay hungry. Another thing you need to do is to be a giver. Say amen. Be what? Give of your time, of your talent and your treasure. Give. Why is, why is giving important? Can you figure it out already? Seed sowing. Can you figure that? Seed sowing. See, this is how it works. I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. God says he will care for me, he will cater for me, he will dress me up, he will do this, that, 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 everything, fine. So God, what should I be doing? Nothing. No. I should be casting my, laying up my treasure in heaven. Is that not true? So my seed. I should be praying. So my time. Say amen. I should be doing what else? Fasting. So my, my spiritual substance. What am I doing? I am not only recognizing God as my source. I will say God is my source. I'm not only recognizing his word as the seed to plant. I'm also recognizing the seed I need to be planting for his will to come to pass in my life. That's how it works. So you sow your time in worship. You sow your time in prayer. Say amen. You sow your seed, your talent, your treasure. How many of you know that when you share what you know, you know it better? So share what you know. He says you should disciple other nations. Disciple somebody. It's part of your own contribution. It's part of your own reaching out to other people. It's not just something you see that, I don't feel led to win souls. I don't feel cut out to disciple anybody. My own is just to pray. I understand that you can spend more time in prayer, but don't leave out the other seeds you need to sow. Am I talking here? Don't leave out the other seeds you need to sow. Who are you discipling? Who are you sharing with? Who are you building up? Say, but I don't know anything. That's not true. You know something. It is the more you give it out, the more you get. That's the way the seed so in principle works. Say amen. How many of you have noticed that when you light another man's candle, your own light does not get smaller? Is that not good news? So light as many candles as you can. What will happen to the environment when every candle is lit? The place is bright. The place is bright. Will God forget your labor of love? No. He, would he reward you? Yes. If you faint not, you just keep lighting other people's candles. When you go so winning, what are you doing? You're planting the seed of Jesus' salvation and story in the heart of somebody else. He says, if you, if, you, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father and his angels. Listen, listen. What, who, what is the work of angels today? They are the ones executing the word of God on the earth. Right? So watch I'm confessing him before men. He's confessing me before his father and their angel and the angels. And in my closet, I'm saying, Father God, I'm asking you for something. Jesus confess, Kola is winning souls. Guys, I'm confessing him before you. And an angel is hearing my prayer. I says, Kola needs this. He says, Oh, here we go. That's me just you see my imagination. <laughs> you see my imagination now. That's how imagination works. It makes the connection with the scriptures. Then you know you have something to work. Even if it is just a figment of your imagination. As long as it's based on the scriptures, still do something about it. Say, so, well, that's just a figment. You will be shocked at how true that can be. Then he said, we'll confess you before his father and his angels. Yeah. And so if he confesses you before them, what are they trying to say? Confess, confess. No, no, they are saying that this man is a laborer on earth. Reckon with him anything he needs. Go do something about it. That's what I believe they are saying. I don't know what else they could be saying. <laughs> <laughs> Say loud, amen. 
Are you getting anything out of this? So develop the practices. Develop a world orientation of study, meditation, confession. In other words, make it a habit. Don't speak evil. Stop it. Don't gossip. Stop it. The fact that something evil happens does not mean you should repeat it. A lot of people don't understand that. When the word says your mouth is like a pen of a ready writer, where does it write upon? Your heart. Hello? Oh, have you heard this? Oh, have you heard that? Oh, this is bad. Oh, that is bad. Things are going wrong. That person just died. That other person had an accident. Oh, there was a bomb blast there. Oh, this, this, this. From morning till night, you speak evil after evil after evil. At the end of the day, your heart is saturated with evil words. And the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence out of the issues of life. What will that heart produce for you? Terrible dreams when you sleep. What will it produce for you? Weakness to have the guts to do anything right. It will wear you out. And then you wonder why. No, don't let the programming of the earth program your own heart. Guard your heart. Amen. You know what? I'm going to spend time in the word. 30 minutes, that's fine. But with that 30 minutes, I'm going to take a scripture and chew on it all through the day. This book of the law shall not depart of my mouth. Meditate there in day and night. Mm. Meditate there in day and night. I'm like a river planted by the rivers of water. My fruit, my fruit will come forth in its own season. And whatever I lay my hands to do will prosper. But somebody just told you, they just laid off that other guy. Somebody told you, that, 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 went, that went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong. And you are saying, all I lay my hands to do will prosper. You know what you're doing? You're guarding your heart with all diligence. Why? That's the production center. Satan wants to flood that heart with rubbish. You can't make it. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, there's death out there. Oh, there's fear out there. You know what? You remember where you're coming from. Nobody ever did this in your home. Nobody ever prospered. All of you are poor. All of you are from a poverty-stricken background. Nothing good can come out of this. And you're listening to all of that junk. You better keep it out. By taking what the Bible says. Say amen. I remember when I went on uh, industrial training as a university student. After work, I'll go into the library and I'll carry one engineering books and six Christian books. And I was meditating in the world. And just before I go, 30 minutes, let me check what engineering has to say. <laughs> I was meditating in the world. You know, a lot of people wait until the crisis hits before they run to meditate in the world. And that's too late. Although it's good to still do it. But what if you have done it before the crisis hit? You know what will happen? You will have had the inner fortitude to see that problem and step on it to a greater height. That, what I'm saying is, don't waste any more time. Start now. So, but I don't know how to meditate. No, you can start. It's very easy. Either you take a, a CD out there and start whatever they say there, just write down, start meditating on that one. Or you study a subject. Or you study a book. Whatever you approach, you give it. You read, you study, you meditate. You read, you study, you meditate. You don't have to do that every day, but know what you're studying at this given time so you have substance to meditate upon. What is meditation? Carrying it in my mind, speaking it with my mouth, painting the picture in the canvas of my imagination. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. From the crown of my head, to the soles of my feet, by his stripes I am healed. Every pain in my body, I command you to go. Now, you know what I'm doing? I'm meditating. But I'm adding prayer to it. <laughs> but I'm speaking God's word. Everything I lay my hands to do will prosper. Remember, the kingdom suffers violence and the violent do what? So I say, what if God doesn't want it to prosper? Go tell that to the birds. What if God doesn't want you to dress nice? Go tell that to the lilies. Don't tell me. Say amen. That's the same attitude you have towards soul winning. That's the attitude you have towards everything that God's word says you should have. 
Can I hear an amen? If God says you should be holy and your flesh says I don't want to be holy, tell your flesh a new master is in charge. You are going to be holy or else. I'm going to starve you. I'm going to make you fast. I'm going to give you no strength until you bow, until you are holy. When your flesh gets the message on a daily basis, your flesh will bow. Says there's a new master here. When your flesh says, I want to be like my friends. I want to boogie down. Tell your flesh, shut up and do what I say. That's what he calls the violent. Take it by force. Am I talking here now? If the devil wants to bombard your mind, if, if, for instance, a thought of death comes bombarding your mind, don't sleep it away. Wake up in your room and say, I shall not die but live. Satan, you have no right over my life. This life has been bought by the blood of Jesus. I am here to fulfill a purpose in God. You are not going to take it. When fear comes very silently and snatches your confidence, don't let it look like, I don't know why I'm so afraid. No, speak back to that fear. The violent take it by. A word is enough for the wise. Have I given you enough to go and chew on today? So power encounter is made possible through consecration, prayer, and fasting. A word encounter or truth encounter which will make you free is made possible through consecration, study, and meditation in the word, which includes confession. We shall stop here today and continue on Sunday. Listen, guys, you need to invest in this process. I'm ever thinking you need to invest. You need to invest in this process. I don't care. I don't care about that. You just make up your mind, you know, that, you know what? Just tell me what price I need to pay. God's grace will enable me to pay it. That's all it takes. Let's go ahead and pray.